Okay, so we've got quite a few questions. So I'm going to run through the questions and then we can continue with the, um, the all risk. So Fricky asks, what if my bag is stolen on the beach? I then claim while I'm still on holiday and they pay out. A few days after they get some some of my stuff back at the police station or lost and found. Do I keep the old items and the new ones and report it to the insurance? Because now I have the new items and some of the old items. Yeah, that's a very, very interesting scenario, Fricky. Thank you for that. So, Yopi, that's a nice curveball. Um, I think what we need to look at there is what is supposed to happen and what happens with most people. Because I think they're, they're, those are not the right, it's not the same thing. Yeah, Fricky, thanks very, very much for the question. Like Lawrence put it out, it, it is a bit of a curveball. If we look at how the basic principle of insurance works, there's a concept called subrogation, which basically means that the insurance company takes over your rights to an item, to a claim, in the event that you do claim with them. What this would mean is that once you've reported the claim and a claim has been paid out, then technically the insurance company owns the item that's missing. They then have the right to recover the item, to recover monies from a third party or any way they, they see fit. Now, when we're referring specifically to all risk, what is supposed to happen is exactly like Fr Fricky pointed out at the end. If that claim is paid, you have replaced your items, then if any items are recovered, you need to report that to the insurance company. Yeah, and give it back to them. Because they are the owners of that, that item now. If you do not, it, they can potentially criminally prosecute you and the terms of enrichment because you are now in a better position than you were before the claim. That's how it's supposed to work. Mm. In reality, how does it work? Not that way. Yeah. Now guys, remember I'm not condoning this. I'm not saying, no, keep the items. Very, very, very important. It has to be reported to the insurance company. You have to then hand those items back to them because they are the lawful owners of the items that were recovered since you were reimbursed for the loss. I think in, in practice what happens is um, if you do report it, a lot of the insurance companies would be, it's going to cost us more to go and try and collect these items than just, well, we've already paid out for it. Um, so, yeah, technically, if you don't, you have now stolen from the insurance company and they should put in a claim against their insurance for <laughs> all risk items. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Fricky. Um, so yes, you should report it and then let the insurance company guide you whether they want to go come pick it up or um, they're going to say, well, we'll pick it up and then just never contact you again. That can also happen. And I think that happens quite a bit. Um, okay, so we've got Warren. Warren, it's good to have you on again. Um, so he's got a question. Hi, Lawrence and Yarpi. Having worked in the insurance industry, I feel that all risk cover is a bit of a scam because the premium you pay, uh, pay is based on the current replacement value of the item, which is generally quite an inflated you know, amount and at an extremely high rate. Then come claim time, the insurance, com insurance companies limits the amount you can claim or purchases the same item or has them crea uh, created at highly reduced rates. I get that they are not there to profit, but they have taken it to the extremes. Okay, so any comments on that, Yopi? Warren, I understand exactly where you're coming from, and thanks again for the, for the question, and thanks for, for joining us this, this morning. Guys, it get, all gets back to replacement value. When we're insuring an item under the specified all risk section, it's up to you to decide how much you want to insure that item for. The insurance company does not prescribe what the value should be. We discussed in the previous show the concept of average or Avery. That does not apply to, to your all risk section. So if your cell phone is worth 10,000 Rand and you want to insure it for 7,000 Rand, you can. There's nothing stopping you. But you have to be certain that you are able to replace the item with a new similar item. When it gets to paying claims, the option is solely in the hands of the insurance company 
as to how they want to settle the claim. They can either do a cash payment or they can replace the item. And people are always at odds about this because they would prefer the cash, the insurance company would prefer to replace. Mm. Why? Like Warren pointed out, insurance companies have preferred suppliers with whom they do millions of rands worth of business on a monthly basis. So they generally get better premium or better rates on electronic equipment or on jewelry or whatever the case might be than the, the, the man in the street would get. So they would prefer to replace it because they can do it for cheaper. Yeah. And and at the end of the day, their job is not to replace the value. It's to put you in the same position you were in. So you had a Samsung uh, S20 and now they've given you another Samsung S20. It's the same position you were in, whether they get it for 3000 Rand cheaper or not. Um, just one thing that, that you mentioned, you choose. So obviously you can't go and re, um, insure your cell phone of 7,000 Rand for 20,000 Rand because again, it's about putting you in the same position. They're not going to pay you out 20,000 Rand if they could put you in the same position for 7,000 Rand. That's very true, Lawrence. Remember, that's why we refer to replacement value. Mm. So when settling a claim under the all risk section, and most claims in actual fact, the insurance company would pay out either the maximum insured amount or or the replacement value of the item, yeah. whichever is less. Yes, Ob- obviously, insurance company always <laughs> will choose the lesser one. Um, and just to get back to self-insurance, especially with, with um, specified um, all risk, risk items, yeah. Let's say you have three cell phones and a laptop and a tablet on on your specified all risk. The total value of all of these items is 50,000 Rand, but not one of the items on its own is worth more than 50. If you want to start self-insuring, how would you suggest to the listeners to do that? Would you put 15,000 Rand in for the highest value of it and have that? Because chances are um, very slim that all of those items will get lost at the same time. Or would you want to build up the whole 50,000 to make sure that you have enough money in reserve to cover all of those? Lawrence, that's again a question you have to answer in conjunction with sitting and working with your wealth strategist, with, with your planner. What I would advise is we have to understand it's a, pr- it's a progression. Very few people have 15,000 Rand lying around. They can just say, oh, cool, now my cell phone's covered. So start off with the small stuff. Start off with saying, right, I'm going to insure my cell phone. The excess on my cell phone is 1,000 Rand, as an example. So let's make certain we've got the excess covered. Because with all risks, the excess would be deducted from the amount paid out. If it's a cash settlement, if it's replacement, then you physically have to pay the cash to the provider. So start off and go through the excesses under your household contents, under your all risk, under your vehicle, and put that in the reserve account first. And then you can slowly start increasing those excesses to bring your premium down over time. Correct. Because by doing that, you're now in a situation where you save premium, so you have more money to put into your reserve account. From there, you sit and analyze the risk. Guys, whenever I speak to to, to, to clients, and you'll hear me say this a lot of times, is understand the risk. Technically, you can insure anything on the planet. I mean, you've got famous actors and models who insure their legs and their face and their ears. and, And some other body parts which we will not mention on air. (laughs) So you can technically insure anything on the planet. The problem is, can you afford to do that? Very few people can afford to insure everything. So it's more important to understand the risk. Let's get back to our example of you with a laptop, kids with a laptop. Mm. Most of the time you're at home. So your laptop, move that to the household content section. Delete it from specified all risks. But the kids take the laptop out a lot. Their laptops. Mm. They go to school, they go and visit friends, they use it at the university, whatever the case might be. Specify that laptop. So now we start categorizing things according to what's the risk of something happening in the event of a total loss. 
what's the chances of this item being a total loss? Once we've divided that up, then we can start saying, right, so my excesses are covered in my reserve account. Let's now move on to the next cheapest item. Next cheapest item would be my sunglasses mm. for 5,000 Rand. And have that in your reserve account. And build that from there. To answer your question about how much should we have available for all risks, I would take an average and say, what are the most likely items that could go missing? If we're referring to theft, that could be damaged, if we're referring to accidental damage. And take an average of those. So let's call it a laptop and a cell phone. Mm. Because where the biggest difference comes in between self-insurance and specifying items is when you're self-insuring, you need not specify the item. You have 20,000 Rand available if any of the laptops go missing, if any of the cell phones you are broken. You can use that. And you can use that. When specifying items, it has to be this specific make of laptop with that specific serial number that something happened to you. Exactly, yeah. So, so you'll have your own pool for specified items. Correct, correct. Okay. So to answer your question, take an average of the most expensive items and make provision for that. We answered this last time around as well. We don't want to be in a situation where we've got hundreds of thousands rands of rands tied up in your reserve account. Yeah, because um, you want to save a thousand rand a month because those hundreds of thousands of rands can generate much more income in an asset than what you're paying for it on the insurance. So you must also keep, again, go listen to that, uh, that show uh, that we did last week because we went into quite a bit of detail on that. Correct. So there's another question uh, from Valma. Um, hi, Valma. Um, so if jewelry is in a safe, not worn every day, do you specify... Um, and then what about Kruger Rands? This is, is a whole other quagmire we have to understand. Under your household contents, expensive items like jewellery, there's usually a clause that says it has to be kept in a locked safe. So make certain any valuable items, and when I'm referring to valuable items, I'm referring to Rand value replacement. You'll, I'll get to why I'm, I'm emphasizing that right now. So those items need to be in a safe and it will be covered under your household contents. Remember, the value your household contents is insured for needs to include that. So if you have a ring which your loving husband bought for you, which is valued at 100,000 Rand, you can't possibly just insure your household contents for 300,000 Rand. You're going to be underinsured. Exactly, yeah. We pointed out your all risk items needs to be added to your household contents when looking at insured value. The same thing applies with Kruger Rands or any type of, of jewelry or, or valuable item. It's always best to keep those things locked up since most insurance companies have a type of clause stating it needs to be kept in a locked safe. No. Now, but make sure that it is part of your household contents value. If it's an item you do not wear on, on a usual basis, I mean very few people in South Africa we do stay in South Africa, would walk around with jewelry to the value of 100 to 200,000 Rand. It's usually kept in a safe somewhere. They wear it on very, very, very extremely special, special occasions. occasions yeah. So leave it under household contents because ensuring that under specified all risk is going to cost you an arm and a leg. Mm. Probably both arms and both legs. <laughs> it's extremely expensive. Yeah. But we have to understand the, the difference between the actual RAND value and emotional value. An insurance company can replace an item based on the actual cost yes. of replacing it. No, not the sentimental value. They can't it's replace priceless. the they can't replace the emotional or sentimental value of an item. Yeah. The fact that this wedding ring was passed down from your great grandmother to your grandmother to your mother to you, you're saving it for your daughter. If you value it in rand value, you take it to, to a jeweler, it's going to be valued at 5,000 rand. That's the replacement value. Mm. So if that ring gets stolen or it gets lost, the insurance company is going to pay out 5,000 rand minus your excess. Yeah. It's not going to replace the ring. Yeah, it can't. So yeah, so you can't insure sentimental value, unfortunately. Which just quickly, Lawrence, on that subject, 
a lot of the times, especially with jewelry, the insurance company would ask for a valuation certificate to prove, first off, what the actual value is and to add in the description a description of the, the item to make it easier to replace it should something happen to this item. Here's an interesting question. So you do have a necklace. Necklace is worth 150,000 rand. Um, you only wear it once a year to the end of year function, the ball you have at work. Do you take that, it's part of your household goods, it's pointless to put it into, into specified all risk, but if you do wear it that evening, so in December you're going to wear it, would you add it to your insurance for that month? That's an extremely <laughs> tricky question. <laughs> I know. Look, looking, <laughs> at the, looking at it from the insurance company's view, short-term insurance is not temporary insurance. Short-term insurance companies don't like you putting on an item and then telling them, I'm just going to wear it for, for tonight. Because... They would charge you a thousand rand to insure that necklace, as For an one example. Night, yeah. In the event that something does happen to that necklace, they have to pay out 150,000 rand. It just doesn't make economic sense. Mm. So if you approach your insurance company and, and tell them, listen, I'm going to be wearing this ne necklace tonight, please specify it for me uh, and take it off tomorrow. They are going to have red lights flashing and saying, no, we can't do this, and all of those items. That's said and done. There is nothing in the rules of an insurance company saying you cannot add an item and remove an item. Mm. So technically, you could phone up an insurance company, say, I would like this to add this item, please. And a week later, phone them and say, please delete this item. Please remove it from my insurance. There's nothing stopping you from doing it. No. They do look at trends. If you do this every second month, then they're going to start asking questions yes. and they could refuse to insure an item. Yeah. Okay. But if it's like a once a year, like my analogy, uh, it's only in December, they probably won't pick it up if it's once a year for a month. Again, kind of thing. short term insurance companies don't do temporary insurance, but there's nothing stopping you from adding an item and removing an item. Okay. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Okay. Next question. Um, so Ruan asks, hi Ruan, it's nice to um, have you on, uh, online with us. Um, I use my cameras for personal use and for business. What would be a better option for insurance? Specified all risk um, under your personal policy, house insurance he says, or is it better to have a business or a commercial policy on, in that specific circumstance? Ruan, thanks very much for the question. And yes, we've, we've got a lot of clients, especially with camera equipment. And even with laptops, you use, you use your laptop for your business or for your, your um, generating an income. Again, we have to go and look at the policy wording. And guys, unfortunately, policy wording is very seldom black or white. It's this massive gray area. So to answer your question, whenever an item is used to generate an income, it needs to be placed on a commercial or business policy. That's technically what, speaking again technically yeah. that's what the rule says that said if you phone up an insurance company and say i would like to take out commercial cover on just my camera and my lens they're going to say no yeah <laughs> why <laughs> we we need to add office contents we need to add liability we need to add various sub sections so which in effect should would then cost you more than just having much the more, camera on your on more. your personal Be, because remember guys all risk cover is all risk cover mm. whether you insure it on a personal policy or on a commercial policy the premium is roughly the same because the risk is roughly the same mm. so you're not going to be saving money putting it on a commercial policy here's what we usually advise people to do first off Disclose to the insurance company that you do use this camera from time to time, if we stick to the camera theme, to take photographs which you charge people for. You can then specify that on your personal policy, on your own house contents policy or risk section. Up until such a time as you actually have a business. So as soon as this starts becoming your main source of income, then move over to a commercial policy because then we can justify adding office contents so we can justify adding the all risk section moving your vehicle over all of those types of other sections 
which is then cheaper as a combined product than it would have been on the, the uh, personal lines policy. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a very good explanation. Ruan, I hope that answers your question. Okay, so let's have, uh, dive into some more questions. So Warren asks, um, another tough Another thought is, what about the electronic equipment that does not belong to us? I.e. laptops, phones, routers, inverters, screens, office furniture that has been provided to us from work, for example. The onus to cover those items lies with the, uh, the employer, but could we t take the responsibility of looking after those items whilst in our custody, for example, in our houses or in our cars? Should, be the, should there be no forcible or violent entry at home or should I not put my laptop in my boot whilst traveling? Who is responsible for covering the loss of insu if the insurance repudiates the claim? So I think where, where that question comes in is can the company, because you have done something wrong, now the company can't claim on their commercial policy, hold you responsible for that? Interesting question. Lawrence, there's, there's a couple of questions Built into in, that one in, into that question so let's first start off and understand what we can insure i mentioned earlier you can technically insure anything to insure an item there there has to be an actual financial loss by the person who insured the item so i for instance cannot go and insure your car mm. because if you write off your car i'm not going to be suffering a financial loss Unless I keep coming to borrow money from you. <laughs> Potentially. So, first off, there has to be an actual financial loss. Secondly, you have to be the actual owner of that item. So, referring to the laptop. If you are not the owner of the laptop, or in some way or form responsible for that laptop, then you cannot insure it. So, that's answering the first part of the question yeah. can that, i insure it yes or no so that's the whole insurable interest so if Correct. you ever hear a, a assessor or insurance company repudiate a claim because of insurable interest that's basically what it is the person who claims must have an insurable interest they must suffer the financial loss the actual financial loss that moves us to this, the second portion and we are discussing short-term insurance here, so I'm not going to go too much in, into, into contracts. But I would advise that you always have some sort of contract with your employer stating who is the responsible person for this item. If the laptop or the cell phone or the car mm. is provided by the employer, there needs to be something in writing saying who is responsible should something go wrong. What a lot of companies do is they would hold the person responsible for the excess mm. that needs to be paid, but they will carry the burden of the insurance. Again, refer to your employer. Rather get this in writing, guys. Protect yourself. This would then also cover any p potential negligence. If the laptop gets stolen or damaged because of your own negligence, who is then, um, who is then responsible for it? Remember, insurance companies cover accidents. Mm. So unless you actually took the laptop and beat it against the wall... Because of frustration, or the printer not working... <laughs> then it is still going to be covered by the insurance company. Now, that brings us back to where is what insured. Because items under our control is potentially covered under a liability section which we'll get to at this rate much later <laughs> but just a quick rundown this would mean that if Lawrence you come and visit me and for some obscure reason uh, you brought your TV along because it's much nicer than mine or my projector or your projector that's a, a reasonable thing Correct. that can happen so your projector that's usually attached to your home cinema so it's attached to the roof it's mm. not something you usually carry around yeah. it's going to be covered under your household content section you come to my house we are having a bride and watching the rugby you brought the projector along if we are then robbed or a burglary takes place at my house then I can claim for that projector under my household contents. 
because I was temporarily in control of this item. So, it, it guys, it's again a grey area, but it can happen that way. If your projector was specified under the all risk section, then it wouldn't have been a problem. Exactly. So in that, in that and that's uh, what I wanted to, to come in there, is if there's no other insurance on that projector because it wasn't on uh, specified, so it was only on a household content, so now I don't have a claim because it was removed from my house, but it was in your care, then you could claim at you, in your insurance because otherwise I could sue you. In, uh, technically technically yeah technically that that's very true but you point out a very important thing this would work if you do not have household contents insurance mm. because otherwise you could claim under your household contents insurance for items temporarily outside of the house okay so it's a five, five, not insured at all you do not have cover at all for this item okay right <laughs> that brings us to the last portion of of the question <coughs> we Warren asked um, sorry could you just have a look at the, the last yeah. portion in our houses or cars should there be no oh, forcible yes. or violent injury Correct. at home now that, that brings us to another vo- very important thing especially when things get stolen out of a car insurance company said or says in their terms and conditions that any time an item gets stolen out of a car it should be in a locked up compartment so if you run into a shop and you leave your laptop lying on the passenger sheets yeah, seat <laughs> yeah not on the passengers <laughs> sheet <laughs> <laughs> if you leave your laptop in plain sight somebody breaks the window and takes your laptop the insurance company can repudiate it it boils down to duty of care i mean just guys think logically you're inviting no. somebody to actually take your cell phone or, or your laptop. Yes. So in that instance, if it was kept in the boot, then it's covered. Yeah. Because it's a locked compartment. So technically, again, if you do that and the insurance company's uh, money, uh, uh, insurance is not paid out, you could, they could technically keep you responsible for that because you didn't have duty of care. Duty of care, correct. And then you could potentially look at your liability cover to claim for that against your liability cover. Okay, but that you'll get into. You could, you yeah. could. But it gets extremely compl- complicated as to how these different items or different subsections interact with each other. Just the last one concerning visible, forcible, violent entry or exit. We, we omitted to discuss this under household contents, but there's a difference between a break-in and a burglary if somebody just walks into your house without you being there and takes items then it's theft Mm. this means that your your payout under the insurance company or from the insurance company is going to be limited again you need to take care of your items Mm. we do stay in south africa but if somebody breaks in there's a burglary there's visible forcible violent entry or exit so they kicked down the door they broke a window anything like that then you will have cover up to the limits as previously discussed okay so have a look at this that said and done we're referring to if you are not at home a home invasion is deemed a burglary because you were still there so if you're on your property and somebody walks in and steals something then it's a burglary Mm. Yeah, and in it's that, forcible and violent Correct. because they're forcing you to not act and stopping them to take your stuff. Totally Therefore, correct. it's forcible and uh, technically viable. Uh, um, violent. Violent, not viable. It's viable for them, though. Um, okay, so next question. I hope that answers your question, uh, Warren. Um, yeah, like I said, there's a lot of questions in that, in that one question of yours. So, Francois says... Hi guys, a little late, but turned in, uh, tuned in for as long as I can. Is there anything insurable that I can leave out to reduce my premium, if that makes sense? I think that comes down to what is primary and what is secondary risk cover. Like you said, focus on the most important things, the primary ones first, and then start going down to secondary. So if you want to uh, give Francois some some um, idea on that. Francois, very, very, thank you again very much for, for the question. It's 
like I pointed out earlier, understand the risk. So when you're sitting down and looking at insuring any type of risk, be this short-term insurance, be this long-term insurance, irrespective, sit down and first determine what exactly is the financial impact going to be and what is going to have the biggest impact on my life as a whole. So to use an example, you have a laptop which you use sometimes for work but mostly to to just have a computer at home. Um, You also have a car because you are a salesperson so you use your car to to go and see clients sometimes you use your laptop other, other times you don't so what is more important what is going to be the biggest financial loss it would be your car yes insuring your car is going to be more expensive but if you don't have a means of getting to clients then you can't generate an income at all yeah if you, something happens to your laptop you can still probably borrow a laptop from a friend. You could replace it with a smaller, cheaper laptop just for the time being. You can use your tablet. You can go take out a contract, a vertical. So what would have the largest financial impact on my life and judge from there? there yeah. So start with those. Yes. So uh, usually when I speak to clients, I say primary risk areas is your building, if you own your house, your household goods, your vehicle. Those are the primary risk areas. Those are the biggest losses. Then you start going into secondary, like specified all risk and uh, things like um, your, uh, what do you call it, Uh, rental vehicles, your uh, top-up covers. All of those things are Mm. added on to it. But get the core, the primary sorted out first. Um, I hope that answers your question. The, The main thing here, I think, is... People need to put a little bit more effort into their short term. We tend to not want to dive into it. It's like, okay, y'all, let him put this on and then we don't look at it again for two years. It is, you need to really look at it and say, are these things important? Do I still need it? Don't I need it? Um, Can I reduce certain items? Um, And do that on an ongoing process. That's the most important part. It is about doing reviews on a regular basis and that's where your financial planner will be able to assist you in making certain in the first instance that you are now correctly insured all your needs are covered your primary needs and then review that process on a annual or biannual basis to make certain that we're still keeping track you know how many times we follow up with people concerning a cell phone or a laptop and they go no i sold that two years ago oh really yeah they keep paying for it and they, they just forgot to, to change it. Mm. Okay, another question from Francois. Um, he says, does adding and removing items in short su- succession affect your premium? I think there's two things. Firstly, does it affect your premium in the short term? And you can explain how pro rata premiums work quickly. And I think the second part of that is, will, it, will they put on like a loading? Will they start looking at it and saying, hey, you remember we had a case with a person who in his personal capacity was buying and selling cars. Vehicles, yeah. And then he put him on and a week later he took him off and then another one and another one. So we had a case like that. So if you can just give um, Francho a little bit of background on that. Right, Francho, let's, let's start off with the whole thing about pro rotas. What is a pro rota? When insuring an item, very seldom do you start insuring that item on the first of the month. And when cancelling an item, very seldom do you cancel that item at, on the very last day of the month. And then we have to take debit orders into account and all of those types of things. So what would happen is as soon as you phone up an insurance company or you let your financial advisor know, I want to add this item, the insurance company is automatically going to charge you from the date on which that item was added up until the end of the month. So for instance, if you have a cell phone you added the premium on that is 300 300 rand yeah it's easy to do the maths you added that on the (laughs) 10th of the month then at the end of the month you're going to be paying 200 rand extra so your premium is going to have been increased by 300 rand to cover the cell phone but you'll pay a once-off additional 200 rand to cover the time period that you were covered for the same applies to when cancelling an item because 
Insurance is always paid up front. Mm. You pay at the beginning of the month for cover during the following month. So if you cancel an item on the 10th, again, the premium was 300 Rand, you cancel it on the 10th, the insurance company owes you 200 Rand. So that will be deducted from your next premium. Okay. So that's the basic concept of, of pro rata. Uh, the calculation is a bit more complicated because usually they work it on an annual basis and then work it back. But in principle, that's how it works. So will it have an effect? Definitely, because you're going to keep on paying pro rotas and yes, you'll get a credit pro rata back, but it's going to play havoc with your finances, adding and removing items. Secondly, like I pointed out earlier when we had the discussion about the necklace, there's nothing stopping you in adding an item and removing it. But an insurance company will look at trends. You pointed out the, the car dealer, mm. which we had, which every other week added a car and removed the car and then added three cars and then removed two cars. And we picked up that trend. And now we need to have an, an honest, open conversation because in the event of a claim, the insurance company could repudiate that claim. Why? Because the first question they will ask is, where's the insurable interest? Mm. Was this call actually yours? Yes. Was it registered in your name? Right? Now, getting that back to all risk, can you provide proof that you actually owned this item in some way, shape or form? So, the insurance company will look at trends, definitely. If adding an item once a year when you go on holiday and then removing it end of January again, generally not a big problem I don't necessarily condone it but generally it's not a big problem but if you start doing it every month every two weeks then they're going to start asking questions yeah. and they could load your premium yeah so um, if you start taking it uh, putting it on the Friday and taking it off every Monday because of the weekend you're going to use it for yes. some reason then you're going to start picking up a problem 